All right. Thank you, everybody. That was great. Thanks, Noel. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, bro. Two of our treasured family friends, Willie Nolan and Bob Nordeman, whom Dad re referred to as Nord, were planning on speaking today, but both were faced with emergent health issues and were unable to be with us today. Our happy thoughts and prayers are with them. Now, Willie wrote down his sentiments, and our family friend, Julie Capel, will convey his message to all of us. Hi, everyone. Okay. All right. Several months ago, Michelle asked me to speak at this memorial to tell a few stories about my experiences with Elba and Mike. I told her I'd be happy to do that. Unfortunately, I've got several issues that require my attention, and I won't be there in person. But I'm here in this place, so we're good. <laughs> I'll share with you several wonderful, funny, and wise interactions I had with these two over nearly 50 years. I met Mike in the summer of 72 at the Coordinating Council for Public Personnel Management. Mike was an analyst, and I was an intern, home for the break from Berkeley. This small agency was loaded with smart young people. Mike, Mike Poggenberg, Lee Casaglio, Bill Heal, and Maggie DeBow, among others. About two weeks into the job, there was an occasion for an outside luncheon. I rode in Mike's car and noticed the personal license plate, Elbat, E-L-B-A-T. I remember that this, the first year for personal plates, so not so common. Intrigued by Elbat, I asked Mike, what's an Elbat? <laughs> he laughed. That's no Elbat. That is the Elba T. He then told me about his courtship with a woman from Puerto Rico who had lost her Navy pilot to a crash, that she was left with three small children, Joe, Eric, and Yvonne. He said he had been a naval officer stationed in Puerto Rico, met Elba, fell in love, and married. He made her sound exotic, fun, and smart. I didn't meet Elba for several months. In December of 72, my then girlfriend Sheila and I were back in Sacramento when Elba and Mike asked us to dinner. They hosted us at an upscale restaurant in Folsom, Coyas, a real treat for us. That lovely evening validated for me everything Mike had said about Elba. She was charming, smart, and fun. Flash forward to 74, and Mike and Elba came to our wedding in Sacramento and when we had our first baby, Ted, in 76, they gave us a gift I see at the top of our stairs every day. A hand-painted porcelain with Ted's name, his weight, his height, the doctor that delivered him in the name of the hospital. This is a gift Sheila and I treasure to this day and a delightful reminder of the thoughtfulness and generosity of Elba and Mike. Mike and I kept in touch, mostly by phone. Then sometime in the mid-80s, Sheila and I got invited to a Christmas party at the Tompkins' home. It was my first introduction to the passion Elba had for Christmas and the fun she had in decorating every available surface with Christmas products. It was like going to Santa's workshop. I loved it. So with regards to the running and biking, Mike told me he had a group of people he knew that met regularly at Maury's downtown that they had adopted the name the Oscar LeVant Society, and unlike their namesake, had a few members interested in fun runs and bike adventures. So Mike asked me if I wanted to jog. That began in almost 20 years of running events like the Lake Merced Christmas Relays, the Zoo Zoom, Hands to Hands, which was Sausalito to San Francisco. Mike affectionately named the group the Fat Boy Running Club and in true fat boy style, pronounced and adopted the three rules of the club. Number one, do not throw up. <laughs> number two, do not finish last. And most importantly, number three, look good at finish. <laughs> Many of you know that Mike had a penchant for using stage names and giving people stage names. 
When he called me, I was always Wilbur, with him generally imitating Mr. Ed, the talking horse, addressing his owner. Mike himself was, of course, L, Michael, or famously, Errol LaGrange. But the one I enjoyed most was Blanchard Hightower CLU. It was a name he used when trying to secure a hard-to-get restaurant reservation. The phone call played out this way. Mike identifying himself as Raynard Smith, PA to Blanchard Hightower CLU, told the person on the other end of the line that Mr. Hightower was in town for a brief period and had always admired this particular restaurant. Smith then inquired as to whether or not the restaurant could accommodate Mr. Hightower and his party. <laughs> Invariably, this worked. <laughs> what is unusual about this for me is that throughout the time I knew Mike, I consulted him on every public address I gave. Whether it was some fundraiser, or in 2009, the father of the bride's speech at my daughter Kate's wedding. All were run by Mike for his input, critique, and wisdom. So while I'm flying solo this time, much of what ability I've got is attributable to Mike's help. Last, I'll leave you with some advice Mike gave me years ago, among the most significant and impactful I've received. Often when we spoke, we talked about the issues that came up in either Mike's work or mine. It was 1989, and I was managing my law firm, and an issue arose between coworkers that I needed to resolve. Mike gave some advice about that particular problem, but what he told me at the end of our conversation was what I remember to this day. He said that most people wanted to do good, not bad, and that almost everyone did their very best with the resources they had, and that if I approached management that way, I was more likely than not to be able to provide resolution. I believe he's used this advice himself at the pearly gates to his and Elba's advantage and got them admitted. Thank you. So next we have Dave and Pat Adams. They would like to say a few words about their friendship with Mike and Elba. This is Pat. <laughs> yeah. I'm Dave. I'm not Dave. <laughs> we go back to Berkeley days. And during those days, there were certain things that happened between the guys that were in a place called Barrington Hall that uh, there were various and sundry things learned there that were used in later life. And Mike was one of the uh, people in our five people room that was, uh, they had some uh, parts of it that were divided off, but it was a very interesting situation. At the time, I did a little bit of drag racing and brought my truck up from Southern California to Berkeley. I did finish two years of engineering basics before I got to Berkeley. And when I got to Berkeley, I found out they wanted you to study. And like Mike, I left the engineering world behind. But one of the things I had totally forgotten about until he had sent me a picture, <clears throat> excuse me, that he forwarded to me and wrote a little note. What I'm about ready to do is read to you what he said. The picture involved my pickup and a 1952 Ford, which was Mike's first car. And a few things that happened during that time period that uh, you might find interesting. So the picture involved the 52 Ford, Mike Tompkins' first car, purchased for $50 in 1961. It is also the car that Mike brought to Barrington Hall at UC Berkeley, where Mike met, met Dave Adams. It is also the car that Dave dragged to Fremont for Mike's first and last attempt at drag racing. <laughs> it is also the car that increasingly refused to start, including the most important date of Mike's career, dinner at the Fairmont in San Francisco with Yvonne Corgonio from College of Holy, Holy Names. Dave, in a gesture of magnanimousness, never to be forgotten, allowed Mike to take Dave's most prized possession, 
the 61 Second Chevy. Most. Okay. This is before the first. <laughs> and on this outing, Mike, thrilled with this prospect, apparently gave the truck more attention than the girl and didn't see much of Mrs. Corgonio after that. Sometimes one has to establish priorities and make hard choices. And with that, he said, happy birthday, Dave, that on was, your 50th. That was, yeah, that kind of day. And from that, Mike and I, a lot of people may not know, uh, <laughs> grew up together. We uh, spent a certain amount of hours, I personally on the back of something called a motorcycle, <laughs> hanging onto Mike's belt with a Yoshika wind-up camera that uh, would take eight millimeter film. And we have various and sundry things that happened during those times, including going out into the dirt and doing donuts and down the street, maybe a little fast. And other things that, uh, that we got into. One of the other things we did involved Pat. And uh, she wrote up a little thing here that uh, <clears throat> it's titled 1966 Yosemite Camping Threesome. I was already a pilot. I'd learned to fly just out of high school and uh, rented airplanes wherever I could. And when I was at Berkeley, it was primarily out of Concord. And Mike would join me. He'd sit in the right seat, and we'd take off and go places and do things that way. Well, this was a really very, what shall I say, fortuitous trip. Because we wound up going to Yosemite. And we had, at that point, graduated and went back to Southern California. So we planned a time to meet with him. And he brought his car and a tent and some gear. And we flew up to Mariposa, where we parked the airplane. Mike met us there. And into Yosemite, we went. We spent the night, and um, Pat prepped a little campfire dinner while the guys hiked up to Vernal Falls. And, or maybe it was uh, Nevada Falls. I forget what it was. Depends who's telling. That's true. That's true. In fact, that's in the writing here. No. <laughs> the next morning, Mike and Dave hiked up to the top of Lower Yosemite Falls. They figured, even in those days, because... Mike wanted to see if he could set a new world's record. <laughs> and we did, we thought. We had a bear that walked with us along the ways. And uh, there's some shale that uh, the trail uh, went over for about uh, a couple hundred feet. And the bear just tracked us right down below. And for many years, I thought that we had uh, lost evidence of that Yashika eight millimeter camera that I had taken pictures of. But lo and behold, I found it uh, within this last year. And I said, that's the bear. Because we did make it to the top of the falls very quickly and back down. Then Mike sat in the right seat while Pat sat in the back. And we took off. In, in the, the airplane. In the airplane. And in those days, you could fly through Yosemite. There were no restrictions. And we slowly climbed up to Half Dome. And in that process, I'd slowly yawed the airplane so the wing would cover Half Dome. You couldn't see it from inside. And I'm pointing out things down below on the left side and behind us over here and everything, and Mike is checking it out. And as we got almost level with the center of Half Dome, I slowly lowered the wing and turned the nose to look as if, that's all you could see out this, the so the uh, uh, screen there. So <clears throat> at that point, he was not sure whether he should uh, do what he did at, like I do at, at, on the ocean. In other words, throw up or make a funny comment. Yeah. And luckily, I gave the, the, I gave the, the uh, controls to Mike, and I said, just hang on, and let's make a left turn. And sure enough, we had slowly made a left turn, because he knew enough about flying and the many times we had been up together on how to control that airplane. And he was a great, great student and a great uh, friend from then on. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, Mike is one of those people that you've heard uh, in the uh, slideshow. There was a, another wedding, and uh, we got married in 65. And Mike was one of the groomsmen 
and we picked him to walk her mother down the aisle. And he was just a brilliant, wonderful part of that wedding. And I know he's been part of our lives off and on and often too long between times that we were able to see him. But Mike was a phenomenal guy. We really miss him and Elba. Thanks, Dave and Pat. We appreciate it.